Uh, hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality of the best hair. And, whew, it's kind of a close call with that curse there. I should share it more often. Anyway, with that out of the way, now I can get back to reviewing any old thing I feel like, such as today's movie, Zombex. A low-budget zombie horror flick from 2013. Zombex is a low-budget zombie horror flick. You've got a small group of characters, a zombie apocalypse, and the various things they do as a result of it. I've already reviewed too many of these kinds of movies to get too enthused about the general premise at this point, but let's take a look at what makes Zombex so special. This time around, the zombie apocalypse is brought on not by radiation or strange virii, but the pharmaceutical companies. A new antidepressant is being tried out, but as it turns out, it really turns people into zombies. It's a bit on the nose, don't you think? Anyway, let's take a look at Zombex and see someone finally standing up to those evil pharmaceutical companies. That only happens about as often as an indie zombie flick. The movie opens in New Orleans, right after being struck by Hurricane Katrina, which they depict with my favorite actual footage of the disaster. Well, at least it doesn't show anyone actually being killed in any of the footage, but... Filmmakers, just because you can use actual disaster footage to depict actual disasters in your movie, doesn't mean you should. Of course, it's more than a little obvious this production was done as cheaply as possible, as we are introduced to Charlie Thibodeau, played by David Christopher, on Bourbon Street. And by that I mean it's sparkling clear that the actor simply walked along Bourbon Street while the filmmakers recorded him on Handycam in hopes that nobody realized they were making a movie and not taping a vacation. Well, he's not important yet anyway. What is, is this omelette du fromage and this elderly couple preparing for the day ahead of them. You eat your breakfast and take your pills, or else that old tractor won't matter because you won't have enough energy to get through till noon. In over a hundred years, we, your neighbors at Chandler Pharmaceutical, knew it was corporate gold number one. But as it turns out, this man has the medicine that turns you into zombies. Because when you have next to no plot, it's really hard to spend any time building up to it. Uh... Her reaction to that seemed rather mundane. Just how often does her husband try to take a bite out of her? She calls 911 over killing her husband with a mild slap, but as it turns out, he's not dead. She is! Chandler Pharmaceutical, paving the road to your recovery. KGCR Gulf Coast Radio. Which has something to do with couch co-op and artistic brooding. The editing has a tendency to be like this, all over the damn place. We see zombie devastation, as well as more Bourbon Street partying, all while listening to the local talk radio conspiracy theorist, Aldo Huxley, played by Lou Temple. He blames the recent, very obvious zombie apocalypse on Chandler Pharmaceuticals, and their damned antidepressants. More importantly, though, Charlie has passed out in the bar, and now we have to figure out just how the hell he got there. You mean how'd I get in here? How did I get in here? I do think they covered it in the transitions, but damn if I can understand the editing in this movie. Since the film kind of fucked up Show Don't Tell when I had the chance, he simply points out that he got wasted drinking with this really hot stripper babe, and just kind of ended up there. This leads to the bartender having a heart-to-heart -heart with him about self-destructive behavior, and how the bartender almost lost everything, and that's what made him turn his life around for the better. Charlie here, though, is fuck all to fix his life up for, so fuck it, he's probably gonna end up drinking himself into a coma, because why not? Especially now, considering that tragic opening with the old people? Well, they were his parents. Daddy is missing, and his mother is very, very fucking dead. I don't know what that is. That ain't my mama. I know the first stage of grief is denial, but when it comes to dealing with identifying a dead body... Still kind of a dick move. We're gonna find your daddy. And we're gonna find who did this. But I repeat myself. Charlie figures he can't just wait around for the police to take care of this and heads out to search for the truth himself. Probably not the best way to speed things up considering he finds himself in slow motion almost immediately passing by the ambulance where we see one of the paramedics has a bright green eye! This, of course, is linked to the drugs and their various side effects. But why listen to the CEO complain about potential risks to profit margins when we can listen to the talk radio spout nonsense instead? Help you get through your week or your month. Help you get through your mortgage. It's 
going to help you get through the grave is where it's going to help you. I don't know. They're undead. When it comes to the whole grave thing, they are notoriously restless. And just for the record, I don't care about some pissant Gulf Coast DJ. None of us do, Chandler. Of course, that doesn't really say much because I really don't care about any of the characters of this movie. Like Charlie here, who we're back to dealing with, in his quest to find his mother's killer, he returns to New Orleans and gets good and hammered so he can think straight. While there were probably plenty of clues as to what happened at the scene, the only thing Charlie here took note of is what he took with him, his father's prescription antidepressant from Chandler Pharmaceuticals. Perhaps if he does research on this drug, he might be able to figure out the... character hasn't noticed the obvious zombie apocalypse going on or the very clear connections between that and this particular drug from this particular company, why the fuck would anyone do that? Even if you're trying to get a buzz, maybe take something that actually gives a bit more of a buzz and isn't well known for its horrifyingly nightmares withdrawal symptoms. I honestly can't figure out if this movie's trying to establish the zombie apocalypse has started or not, because sure, we see hordes of zombies running down the street eating people, but in that situation, who the hell would stop to interview a radio personality, no matter how popular, to get their take on exactly what they think is causing problems in the community? We've seen the effects these mind-numbing pills have been causing. I'm used to horror movie characters being dumb, but this is stealth game guard levels of unaware. How can you Connie. definitively say that it has anything to do with pharmaceuticals? Can it not be a waterborne parasite? Bitch, put down Plague Inc. for a second and take in the situation. There are zombies fucking everywhere eating people around you. Put the fucking camera down and get the fuck out of there! Federal Drug Administration does not know anything about this trial being put upon... <laughs> I saw this movie so cheaply made, he didn't even actually throw the glass. He, I mean, don't want to break it now. Might need it for another take. Unfortunately, the zombie apocalypse did happen. I think. Business as usual and a zombie apocalypse. Rush Chandler, CEO of Chandler Pharmaceuticals, played by Pierre Kennel, hires out a mercenary team led by Katie Ann, played by Emily Kay. I want to hire you to take out these... these creatures. So you need my muscle to clean up your mess again, huh? Maybe don't act like you're not interested in this job without enough pay. From what I've seen, he could just let the zombies roam free and kill everyone and nobody's really gonna care. There's somebody here I want you to meet. Dr. Solis. <clears throat> meet Katie Ann. Well, <laughs> now, now, boys and girls. Malcolm McDowell, what the hell are you doing here? Besides giving a very clear answer as to where exactly this movie's budget went. Uh, Dr. Solis is the executive director research and development here at Chandler. Yes, uh, thank you. And when you pay big bucks for a big name actor, maybe don't have the nameless guy who's given lower billing in the credits talking over him. That's my job. Dr. Solis here explains that Hurricane Katrina absolutely devastated New Orleans. No, no, not, not the property damage or even the death. Nope, it's the PTSD the survivors were left with that was the real problem. Therefore, he developed a drug to solve the problem. Slight issue being that there's that teensy-weensy side effect where they kind of lose their minds and start killing people and eating them. You've got to understand, there was such an extreme need for this drug that it was fast-tracked through development into clinical trials. Without this drug available to the general public, well, this movie's plot makes even less sense. So while their tests seemed okay, it turns out after you take enough of this shit, it just about leaves you brain dead while at the same time poisoning your blood. Therefore, the only thought in their head is to kill people and drink their blood. Yay, more zombie vampires. Oh well, off to work, I guess. Hold on, y'all. I got these two. Did she even shoot the one on the left? Why, why, why did they die? I know why the one on the right died. She shot him six times! Forget that Mercs vs. Zombies plot for a bit, though. We've got to go back to fucking talk radio. Yay! At least this time he gets a call from someone I do enjoy watching, Malcolm McDowell. I'm not entirely sure why this guy thinks it's a good idea to call up a motherfucking radio personality who hates him and has all kinds of conspiracy theories he peddles around in order to tell him, oh yeah, that pharmaceutical drug? Well, sure, it's causing the zombie outbreak. I'm really sorry about that. On top of that, he mentions that there just so happens to be a cure! A serum that will prevent you from becoming a zombie if you take it within 72 hours of taking the antidepressant. Oh yeah, everyone who's already a zombie is too far gone and needs to be killed. 
Oh well, thing is, they can't get the serum to the people because the government has declared Louisiana as a no-fly zone. I don't know, for some reason, and your guess is as good as mine, the government refuses. Jesus, having lesser actors interrupt him wasn't good enough. Even the editor wants in on the action now. This movie did have an editor, right? So they can't get that serum that's over in Austin, Texas, but Huxley swears that he will take it upon himself to make that road trip and save the day! But, Charlie, I'm not sure you know what the hell you're doing here, but how do you know that that was in fact a zombie? Maybe he just didn't have his coffee yet. So back with that radio personality hero plot, it turns out Huxley just got a package delivered! A package with... Anti-Zombie Serum in it! Oh, that problem got solved real fast. For some reason, though, he still seems to think he has to go to Austin to... get serum? Get more serum? I don't know, but he packs up the cure to drive it far away from the people in need, and starts his adventure. Are you out of the I am. Do I know you, sir? Oh, that's just our protagonist, Charlie, who just so happened to drive right up right at the right time to shoot those zombies right between the eyes and save the day. Ah, channeling his inner Seagal for how perfect that went. Not bad for a drunk whose brain is literally rotting away. Not to mention Huxley isn't remotely concerned about hopping in the car with this random crazy asshole. Then again, why should that phase him considering during this zombie apocalypse, life goes on! Dealing drugs? Sure, whatever. Just some zombies running around killing people. Still gotta keep the lights on, after all. Also, there's the Mercs, but it seems getting more information out of Chandler Pharmaceuticals is going to be harder than reasonably expected. Even if I could get the stats on how many pills are distributed, there are these street dealers out there grinding the shit up, mixing it with God knows what else. Number one, you are the CEO. You should be able to get this information. Your name's on the company. You are privy to all of this. You are acting CEO. This shouldn't be hard. Number two, so fucking what? Drug dealers are grinding it up and mixing it with other shit. They're not manufacturing this stuff, so the information on how much you put out there is still quite valuable. Which means he tells her nothing, establishing he wants the zombies dead and she doesn't like him very much. Well, that was a fine use of our time. Fuck! Forgot my line! Gotta do another take! What's that? The camera battery died. Oh, fuck it, let's just use that one. This is Rush Chandler. Make it quick. Hey, Rush. Go fuck yourself. We're going to Texas. Well, at least you left him a message so he knows you've turned on him. Or hell, maybe he just wants you dead because you left a voicemail instead of a text like a civilized human being. Thus, instead of fighting zombies, Katie and her friend and colleague Thea, played by Desiree McKinney, go forth and fight zombies. But not simply to kill zombies, no, they're looking for a car. Because the car they were just in isn't car enough anymore? You got a hot wire car? And what exactly gave you that impression? Whatever her reasons, we're back on the road with Charlie and Huxley. However, Hux notices Charlie's weird green eye and knows he's turning zombie from that one fucking pill. So BOOM he hits him with the anti-zombie serum, completely negating any relevance that particular plot thread could have had. With that in mind, we better get what characters we have together in a hurry, therefore Charlie and Huxley happen to run into the girls, who chose a poor car to hotwire as it's run out of gas already. Also, they changed into their hot pants, just because. Look here, dude. I don't know what you're wanting, but you need to put that fucking gun away now. Charlie, what are you doing? Fucking everyone's walking around with guns. And for good reason, there's a fucking zombie apocalypse going on. Sometimes. As it turns out, Charlie knows this woman. You see, during that drunken, poorly edited Bourbon Street scene, the dancer Charlie was spending his night with was none other than Katie and herself. I guess stars ain't paying so well these days. Somehow knowing he is the drunken asshole that wouldn't leave her alone that night means now everyone trusts each other. Give it out! Well, that's just my buddy, Boo. Well, how about we take this happy homecoming on inside where it's safe? Even the man who wasn't part of this conversation only knows one of the people involved. Or, well, uh, he's close friends with one, the other is a famous radio personality, and two ladies are wearing high heels and short shorts. Eh, fuck it, save them all. Charlie's friend would be Boudreaux, played by Edward St. Pei. 
P... P-E apostrophe, however that's pronounced. He offers them a drink for not dying, and fuck it, ain't got nothing better to do. I mean, what else are we supposed to spend the running time on? Character development? I decided I don't want to be a part of the problem anymore, I want to be part of the solution. So instead of killing zombies and getting paid for it, I'm going to run from zombies and not be paid for it. As well as head to Austin, Texas to get that serum that we already have. Yeah, fuck it. Drunken party. Which Boudreau refers to as a hurricane party, and yes, that is a thing down south. Disaster strikes and it knocks out the infrastructure for a while and there's no power? <laughs> fuck it. Drink all the booze and eat all the meat before it goes bad. Not entirely sure that's the best strategy during a zombie apocalypse, however. I mean, I've never had a hurricane break in my window and try to eat me. Okay, now it's your turn. Start kissing. Oh, yeah, there's that Chandler guy in the story, too, and I guess he has a family. A family of dumb fucks who doesn't realize that a zombie apocalypse is kind of serious. None of this makes any sense. We're running off in an armored truck to escape from How some genetic How much did I pay freaks? for this damn TV, anyway? Watch your mouth. There is a child present. Witnessing the undead and cannibalism is one thing, but damn, might warp their fragile little mind. Also, nice job being careful with the remote there. You wouldn't want to break it. Might need it for another take. Introducing new characters is a bit much for this story, though, so Chandler's family is attacked by zombies and killed anyway while he escapes. In the spirit of ensuring the plot is as simple as can be, Charlie gets a call to let him know his daddy became a zombie from taking those pills, just in case he didn't figure this out by now. <laughs> Smells like gun. Listen to me. Well, I've talked over enough of this movie, so fine, go ahead. You don't make it through this. <sighs> Thank you. This hasn't been easy, to be honest, but I've got plenty of experience sitting through movies that I really haven't enjoyed. You ain't got no choice, bro. Oh, well, fuck you. I can turn a bad movie off whenever I like. There ain't nobody else. Well, I don't think that arguing with a figment of my imagination makes my statements any less valid. Continuing to point out the obvious, we see both of the ladies are indeed having sex, while around the same time, the drug-dealing gamers just so happy to be getting their comeuppance, meaning no further scenes will have to be interrupted by any more side notes about them continuing to do nothing. Boudreaux is trying, at least, pulling out of his ass some mythical good luck charm that if you rub it in times of need, you will be okay. Too bad it's never brought up again. But the ladies being into ladies sure is. Wouldn't want to forget that. Like, look out, duty. Oh my god! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Fuck me, Ronnie! That's the first goddamn thing that got in here. Fucking how? Barricade? Backdoor? Jetpack? As far as I can tell, the motherfucker just walked in from off screen. But as long as they stick together. I got bad news, boys. You just pretty girls y'all brought, they're gone already. I was trying to go to the car with them, but they wouldn't let me go. It'd be alright, man. Them girls are tough. They're strong, independent women who don't need no man. Or for us to hear any of their lines for a while. They're talking, but there's no audio for what they're saying, and they're either being followed by zombies or the damn film group keeps walking into frame. Either way, what ends up happening is Katie cuts her girlfriend employee's hand to... make her bleed? I guess that was to lure the zombies into a choke point, even though, last I checked, they're not like sharks. They come for you just as well, even if you're not bleeding all over the place. Uh, ah, well, whatever the purpose of that scene, it's over now, and everyone continues on their quest to head to Austin, Texas. However, along the way, Katie finds a survivor with some distressing news. You're going the wrong way. Everyone's dead back there. How many more are there? More than you can imagine. Well, how'd you survive? The questions don't matter, man. Yeah, it's not like this has been a reasonably coherent story up to this point. Why start now? So evidently, Texas is fucking dead, too. Or it isn't. I don't know. It's not like this general population cares either way. Point is, now that whole got-separated thread can get the fuck out of the movie, too, as everyone gets right back together again. Just in time, too, as night's falling, and fortunately they just so happen to have a handy-dandy boat to go out on the lake and avoid the zombie horde while spending another night getting drunk and making asses out of themselves. I want to go out on a limb. And say what we're probably all thinking right about now. And what would that be? Well, there's less than 20 minutes of movie left, and someone's probably going to die. And we all know who dies first in these situations.
Okay, maybe she was actually worrying that the zombies might know how to swim, but at the end of the day, we're both right. Which means she's dead as shit, being ripped apart by the zombie horde. Also, they point out that the anti-zombie serum doesn't really help when your problem isn't that you took the wrong pill, but rather you've been torn apart by zombies. Ah oh, well, Mr. Chandler is still on the run, but he has to stop for gas. Company card pays for this one. No, 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 fuck. There's no pay at the pump. God, I hate it when I have to interact with people. Especially when the only people left to interact with are brain-dead zombies. As in, the, the kind that want to kill you and drink your blood. Fuck you! Well, to be fair, the zombies probably were the most likable characters in that scene. Important characters are dropping left and right, so why stop now? Mainly because Huxley has to go take a leak, so rather than stay with the group, he's gonna go out on his own near the trees. However, while his behavior is borderline suicidal, Katie is way past the borderline in that department, heading forward into the zombie horde now that her love is lost. Ah, this is one of those sad, artistic deaths. Art. Well then, with only two characters left and about ten minutes of running time to go, they finally make it to Texas! Which isn't full of zombies, but rather government assholes. Thus, Charlie and Huxley are captured and questioned by none other than Captain Spaulding himself, Sid Haig. Don't worry, I won't bore you with all the details. No, 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 son. Bore me. Bore me. Fuck it, I already sat through this movie once. I really don't want to have to go over that nothing again. Oh, I guess that works. Just go over the events of this movie again, and this time in a fast-paced musical montage. I'm disappointed at you, Charlie. He told you to bore him. And then, one of the zombies starting eating your pussy to death! One more time, son. Just how much exactly do you drink every night? He does embellish the story a bit. I don't remember the time he found a being made of pure energy and had an artistic moment. But it doesn't matter anyway. Who should happen to show up but Dr. Solis? Well, as it turns out, a random Corey Feldman appears. Dr. Solis! Oh my god, Peter! How are you? Well, I know you were. We almost made it to the top of the mountain. God damn it, what is it with this movie and focusing on characters other than the ones I'm interested in? The specifics of their story and all that shit about the serum is completely pointless anyway because twist ending! Dr. Solis was in fact a bad guy all along and did design the drug to turn people into zombies. The only reason he went on the radio to talk about a serum was to... Um, well, these guys came down and got injected with phase two drug of... Something. This radio personality and famous singer. No one could possibly notice them disappearing. Well, should we go get a... Mm -hmm. I care a little bit about humanity. What about you, Solis? <laughs> I think it's obvious by my appearance in this movie that I really only cared about the paycheck. Anyway, that was Zombex. What a fucking train wreck. Low-budget zombie horror movie out of a bargain bin of DVDs. No, I wasn't expecting much going in, but holy hell does this movie have problems. The editing is all over the place, with scenes not so much leading into one another as being slapped here and there throughout the movie. Still, though, the big problem was that the plot wasn't even particularly coherent in the first place. Which is pretty impressive considering it wasn't complicated either, but when you try to make sense of it, dear god. So, a bad doctor made a zombie drug which was spread throughout New Orleans, causing a zombie apocalypse that was or was not noticed, but a serum was made that did work and was sent to a radio personality with instructions to go to Austin to get the serum that he already has. They get to Austin and are instead taken in for phase two something who fucking cares. I had all movie to get invested in these guys and I really don't care if they got saved or turned into zombies or shot into the sun. There's also the side plot with Chandler and the stuff going on with the dancers turned mercs turned zombie slaying babes, but that matters even less than the serum, so yay. 
Overall, Zombex is a jumbled pile of parts, stitched together in not the most elegant manner. If it were a Frankenstein monster, it would have eyes for nipples and an ass for a face. As a movie, it's so bad it doesn't even really have that B-movie charm that helps bad movies at least feel fun. Coming in at one completely unnecessary drug-dealing subplot that does nothing and goes nowhere, out of five. I sometimes feel like the joke film projects me and my brother did long ago would actually give some of these indie flicks a run for their money. But thank you all for watching, I'm Medeka Shadow, and remember... Don't take someone else's antidepressants. Of all the self-destructive behavior in this movie, that still just wows me.